Thank you all for attending, and welcome to the library. My name is Dr. Richard Togman, CEO of the Thunder Bay Public Library. The library holds a sacred space in our community. It is one of the few places where everyone, regardless of age, income, background, ethnicity, or orientation, can come together to engage with their neighbors. The library exists to share knowledge and understanding and to help build community. Libraries make our neighborhoods strong. Because of this unique place we hold and the special relationships we have with residents, the library is the perfect place to hold election events. One of our fundamental rights as citizens is the right to vote, and voting necessitates being informed. What better place to learn about what each and every candidate for local office stands for than at your neighborhood public library? As a nonpartisan organization run independently from the city, we are honored to be able to fulfill this essential role, that of helping to educate and inform the public and provide a neutral platform where all candidates can share their vision for our great city. We're so happy you could join us this evening while we check out the mayoral candidates. To prepare for the event, we reached out and asked the community what questions they wanted the candidates to answer. From this list, we boiled it down to a set of diverse questions that span the range of issues that a mayor will likely have to address over their term. The question and answer portion of this event is being live streamed and will also appear on our YouTube channel for viewing for those who couldn't attend. Now, before we begin our formal agenda, the Thunder Bay Public Library would like to pay respect and acknowledge our local indigenous authorities. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and stewards of Fort William First Nation within the Robertson Superior Treaty of 1850 and all of the sacred Anishinaabe grandmothers, grandfathers, elders, youth, and members who have come before us and have carefully guarded the land and all that it provides. We also acknowledge the contributions to our community by the Métis people. The Thunder Bay Public Library is committed to working with and understanding the history that has brought us to reside on this land and acknowledge our responsibility as treaty partners to provide access, accessibility, and assistance to anyone wishing to use library services or space. Now, we have some special guests with us tonight to help moderate the event. Thanks, Sarah Lewis and Michelle McKenzie Landis. Now, Sarah Lewis sits as the newest member of the Public Library Board. Most recently, she led Lakehead University through the pandemic as Director of Student Success. Previous to her role at Lakehead, she specialized in economic and workforce development, helping cities as varied as Calgary and Nipigon manage multi-million dollar revitalization programs. Sarah also sits on the board of the Northwest Ontario Innovation Centre and is currently pursuing her PhD in Education Studies, where she's exploring the potential of digital technology in artificial intelligence and learning. Michelle McKenzie Lander is a well-known community member and key staff person at the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association. As the Resettlement Assistance Coordinator, Assistance Program Coordinator with the Multicultural Association, it's Michelle's job to help international newcomers settle here in Thunder Bay. Michelle is a longtime coordinator and event planner for the Folk Rose Festival. In an effort to broaden community input and facilitate greater community involvement, I've asked these fantastic community leaders to choose which questions they want to ask of the candidates and put the questions to the candidates <coughs> directly. Their background and experiences put them on the front lines of building our community and ensuring its prosperity. Now the question list was distributed to candidates in advance so they could prepare and be informed, so there's no surprises or trick questions. While the candidates know the question list, they don't know which questions will be asked of which candidate. Each candidate will have a maximum of two minutes to answer the question. After a 15 second grace period, we will interrupt the candidate if they continue to speak. Now, for your convenience, there's a screen at the back with a countdown clock. Right? When the green light goes on, it means you're in your first minute. The yellow light will illuminate during your second minute. And when the red light flashes, it's time to sum up. Now there'll be three rounds of questions with each candidate being asked one question per round by our community members. Now, before we introduce the candidates, I want to give a special thank you to the library staff who made these election events possible. I may be standing here in the spotlight tonight, but it's the dedication, hard work, and long hours of library staff who make events like this the centerpiece of our community life. Now bear with me, because it took a lot of people to make these election events as successful as they have been. So from our building and maintenance staff, I'd like to thank Chris, Nelson, Rob, Jesse, Chase, Dante, and Zephania. Librarians Ryan, Amy, Laura, Richard, Sylvia, Robin, and staff members James, Lori, Michelle, Marilyn, Shannon, Lori, Derek, Hera, Jana, Crystal, Vivian, and Janet all worked tirelessly over the last few weeks to pull everything together.
I'd also like to thank my directors, Stephen, Angela, and Sherry, for their contributions to making our events the successes that they are. And I'd like to extend a special thank you to Tina Maroniz and Riley Zurich. Tina is our Director of Community Development, and Riley is our Assistant for Community Development. This team quarterbacked all five of our election events. If you've enjoyed watching the Q&A at home or attending events in person, you largely have Tina, to Riley, Tina and Riley to thank. So thank you to them. All right, now to the main event. So first up, let me personal welcome the mayoral candidates. Right, from left to right, we have Ken Boschkoff, Clint Harris, Gary Mack, Robert Schapansky, and Peng Yu. It takes a, yeah. It takes a lot of courage to run for mayor, and I congratulate you for stepping forward to share your vision of the community with us tonight. I'm now going to hand it over to Sarah and Michelle, who will ask the questions of our candidates this evening. Thank you so much, Richard, and, um, and thank you uh, for your leadership in bringing these events together. And so now, here we are, uh, ready to make some decisions, everyone, and, and hear what everyone has to say. Um, I have the first section, and that is our candidate introductions. And so each candidate will begin by introducing themselves and highlighting their platform and goals should they be elected. So in 60 seconds or less, please tell us about yourself. And so we'll start with Ken Boschkoff. Thank you. Just a little closer. Oh. Thank you very much. Over my career, uh, in various roles, whether it's the Port Authority, the Stoll Golf Tournament, the Med School, the Symphony Orchestra, or the National Martial Arts Championships, uh, when people were looking for a leader to help them in tough times for those organizations, I was the person that answered the call and helped organize, fundraise, and bring those organizations to successful and tremendously uh, popular events in our community. That honed my skills in leadership, governance, organization, fundraising, business development. All of those things uh, as a team leader that are vital for someone who is going to lead a council of new people without any experience and some hardy veterans who probably have their own mind about what they want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Well timed. And now, Clint Harris. Hi, thank you all for being here. Well, in the last 25 years, um, I worked uh, for the newspaper industry, which is obviously a, a large corporation that managed a, a vast area, including our region. Um, while in that career, I was the national sales representative that visited Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal uh, 20 some odd times a year. During that period, I chaired the Research Institute to, through the cyclotron and through isotopes being created through our, in our hospital. Um, I was chair of the Public School Board Foundation for 13 years. I was a member of the Foundation Board for the hospital for approximately 25 years. Same amount of time with the United Way the past president of the auditorium, past president of the Arts Council. I spent a lot of time either on teams or leading teams. Um, I'm Googleable, so you can actually look to see the successes and I can explain them to you. And personal uh, sort of experiences. That's time. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. And now Gary Mack. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out on this rainy night. It's great to see so much enthusiasm here, so much interest in the local election. It's really exciting. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Richard Togman and the uh, staff of the library for hosting these events. I was at all four last week, and they were so amazing. What a great way to see all the candidates together and really get a sense of who's bringing what to the table. It's really terrific. Um, and I'd like to thank my fellow mayoral candidates, too. What great company I'm in right now. I'm quite proud and honored uh, to be here. Um, I've been knocking on doors all summer. Um, 
started it in the beginning of July, trying to hit as many doors as I possibly can. And there's one thing I'm hearing over and over again, Thunder Bay wants change at city council. We want a mayor who is responsive to what the citizens are really asking for. And when I talk to people, I say, what are your concerns? What is on your mind right now? They're saying three things over and over and over again. It is crime, homelessness, and our roads. Some people talk about other things. They throw in things for a little bit of color, keep me on my toes once in a while. But generally, that's what the citizens want of Thunder Bay. We want our homeless taken care of. We want our police to be responding to the serious crime that we have happening in our city. And we want um, we want our roads to be drivable. And, so, and that's time. Oh, no way. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Robert Chapansky. I've spent a lot of time talking to people as well. And a big thing I've noticed about not just the city, but politics in general is the world is moving faster and faster. We're evolving to new and new heights every single day. And yet our, our politicians are stuck in the past, yearning for what they had when they were young. But that's not what we should be striving for. We should be striving for a better future, a newer tomorrow, something different, wild, exciting. We should want change. We should want a better world. And that's why I'm here, because I am that change. I'm going to be different. And this is, world we live in, it's not going to be the same as it was yesterday. And that's a good thing. I want to fix mental health in this city above all else, because I firmly believe that if we take care of our most vulnerable citizens, they will give to us tenfold and make this city not just great, but amazing. Like, we live in one of the most beautiful places aesthetically, but because we don't care about the lowest common people, the city suffers for it. We have to care for our own, and they'll care for us tenfold. And, and that's time. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Pang Yu. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my little wife and I, we moved to Thunder Bay in 1990. We came here, no money, knowing very little English. But I have my dream. I follow my dream. I sincere, sincerely want to contribute back to this lovely community. I'm a current counselor at the large, and I'm also a small business owner over 30 years right here in Thunder Bay. I'm very aware of the current issues that we face, and also the opportunities that are available. I'm ready to hit the ground running with a bold vision positive energy, leadership, experience, and a strong allies with all levels of government. I strongly believe that together, we can grow our city to make it safer and more attractive. We have to make a tough decision. We have to have timeline get project done. That's why wording is just for wording, lip service. I want to see the action. I am determined to serve our community, make a tough decision, make a Sunday Bay move forward. And no, just time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. <laughs> what an exciting group of candidates with great ideas for our community. I don't know about you, but we're just getting started, and I'm excited to see the answers to our next set of questions. And so again, I'm Sarah Lewis, and I'll uh, be handing things over to Michelle. Uh, Mackenzie Lander to introduce the question and answer section. Thank you. Good night, everyone. So we're not going to waste any time. We get right into our Q and A's. Uh, and our first question is directed to Ping Yu. Uh, City Council appointed the majority of the members of the Police Service Board with two councillors sitting and one community representative appointed by council. This allows council to indirectly shape the future of policing in our community. What strategies would you like to see implemented by the Thunder Bay Police Service to address crime in our community? Yeah, th thank you for this question, this very important question to our community. So first, we have to understand the mayor and city council it's a really no control of police board or police service. And we've been dictated by, you know, uh, the matters chief or, or whatever, it's called operation. Operation we cannot touch. We can do is approve the budget, say yes. If we don't, we have other issues, why? Appeal. So most time we lost. 
So, I just a mayor even sitting on the uh, uh, the, the uh, police board. But we need to collaborate with up -gover provincial government. We need to deal with chair of OCPC. We have to work with them. And meanwhile, we can do is one thing: a policy. The policy should be made just by public uh, police service board. Should be made from a general public. We should have voice from former First Nations, from you, and from chiefs, from uh, uh, board members. We have to give direction for police. Uh, and then we can make a better decision because this is called community policing service. Another part is very important. How can we operate the police even though we cannot say it, but we want to see the result. We want our community to be safe. Because the first issue is we need to grow our city. We need to make it more safe, safer and attractive. So without the policing, without the front line police officers hard work, we hard to do that. How can we do that? We must collaborate with, with the provincial government. We need more funding. We need more resources to fight guns against, to fight addictions, to fight mental health, to make life better for everyone. So I like to see more police tools be used, for example, neighborhood policing. For example, the cut down the- Okay, that will be time, thank you. <laughs> I have the next question and it's for Rob Shapansky. Uh, homelessness is a major issue for Thunder Bay. With winter approaching and the recent cancellation of Shelter House's FOS program, our homeless population is, an increasingly, is in an increasingly precarious position. What will you do to address the challenge of homelessness in Thunder Bay? So first things first, I'm going to do everything in my power to bring back the SOS program. Even if it means my paycheck as mayor would be cut, it's a good sacrifice because that's a program we desperately need. And I'm going to do everything in my power to help warm, find warm houses and more affordable housing because a good chunk of homeless people in the city have jobs and the rent is just too high for anyone to afford somewhere to live. Um, unless you're willing to like bunk up with six other people to split one insanely high bill, your options are extremely limited. So yeah, I want to bring back the SOS program put more funding into the homeless shelter and maybe even build another one. Uh, do, basically, I want to sit down and talk with the people out there who need help because a lot of people just tend to go, I don't want to look at that. I don't, I've, I've had multiple emails saying, it's like, what are you going to do to get rid of the tents? Get rid of the tents. It's like, people need somewhere to live and the shelter house is full. So, yeah, fine. They're not the most aesthetically pleasing, but... It's somewhere for them to live, somewhere for them to be out of the elements and be safe. Uh, one of the big things I want to do is reopen the LPH because I firmly believe that a lot of people who are homeless cannot psychologically take care of themselves. Because when the LPH shut down, guess what? Homeless population went up. If we reopen it or open a different facility where people can be properly taken care of, then they have somewhere to go, somewhere to be safe. Because... Homelessness will never go away in, in our societies so long as we don't treat people as equals. And that's what I want to do because I've been there. I've struggled. I've had to go to the RFDH for food. I've been out on the streets for days or weeks at a time. I know the struggle and I want to do everything in my power to make sure no one struggles like that ever again. to our next question, and this is for Ken. The previous council has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants and preliminary work on a proposed police headquarters and the indoor sports facilities that were never built. What would you prioritize or deprioritize these large capital projects, or are there other priorities you believe council should address first? People who live next door to homeless encampments would probably say they would like those addressed first. Uh, parents with 
teenage children or young children <coughs> would probably say they want uh, rinks and they want a new soccer facility. Uh, people who uh, really care about society know that we have to spread that amount of tax money in addressing all of these problems all at once. Uh, so let's start with the homelessness. We know that all over North America, some cities have been very successful. Our, the tent encampment situation here is growing. My solution would be, as leader, to call those groups and organizations that have been working on these, uh, not necessarily separately or in competition, but to pull them all together and say, you know, we're a city of 110,000. Uh, do we need 10 organizations? Maybe we do, so I'm willing to learn. But the point is, until we organize ourselves to really address these issues head on, uh, we will always be treading water, staying in the same place, addressing them on a piecemeal basis. So if you want to solve a problem, you have to have leadership. You have to have someone who's gonna say, okay, uh, are you gonna work with us? Uh, because you're getting city funding, so we want you, if you're gonna be helping us, uh, we're gonna pull together and we're gonna go in the same direction. And although every problem has varying degrees, at least we're gonna make some headway. City, other cities have solved these things, or at least, uh, you know, the poor we always have with us. This famous uh, guy who lived about uh, 2,000 years ago uh, said, but the bottom line is, if we want to do this, we have to organize and we have to be sincere about addressing the problem. Thank you. I have the next question. And this is for Gary Mack. Many parents struggle to secure spots in childcare facilities, which sometimes prevents parents from returning to the workforce. Would you endorse an increase in the city's child care programs, and how would you deal with the cost of raising a child for Thunder Bay parents? A couple of things here. I was just at the door last night talking to a lady, uh, a young mom, who's really struggling. To, she has no, uh, she's uh, been waiting for uh, the, the entire life of her child for uh, daycare. She can't go back to work uh, because of um, uh, the city, uh, because there's no child care places for her child. Um, the DSAB is short about 2,300 childcare placements right now. If the city is going to be supporting our labor force, we have a labor shortage here in Thunder Bay. And if we're going to be supporting that, we need to support that by putting our money where our mouths are and having childcare placements. So that's a DSAB responsibility. But as mayor, we will have influence over um, the decisions that are made at the DSAB. We need, need more childcare spots and we need to support um, our labor force to be able to work. Uh, I, have a, I have a small business, as you know, and uh, we often have have our staff calling in sick, not because they're sick, but because they don't have childcare. Their childcare hasn't, hasn't followed through. So we need to have that in, in our thing. We really need to be able to also attract more professionals to Thunder Bay. And one of the issues is that's keeping people from, uh, from relocating to Thunder Bay is our reputation. I really believe that we must change our city so that our reputation will change and we'll be able to attract the kinds of professionals and um, uh, businesses that we want to have setting up here in Thunder Bay. So thank you. Thank you, Gary. <coughs> so our next question is for Clint Harris. Thunder Bay is projected to have a labor shortage in the near future, and many businesses complain about getting the skilled labor they need to grow. What is your plan to attract the labor force we need in Thunder Bay? Well, when you think about the uh, the lack of employment and and what happened after COVID and the and the government sponsoring um, and paychecks uh, that were more than what they actually made when they were working, it, it, it created this culture of you know, the challenges of people wanting to go back to work. Uh, we are surrounded by a community or communities outside this region that I believe is untapped. We have an influx of immigration coming to our community. Uh, who show up here and have to re-socialize on their own. Um, I truly believe if we set up a system to where, you know, the reserves in the indigenous community actually came to Thunder Bay and we greeted them um, sort of as recruits as opposed, as opposed to, you know, 
a, bar a boring sort of response to their, what they take up in our community. We could train and recruit and fulfill the needs of the indigenous relationships in our community, fill the positions that are required as we've seen immigration from you know, our friends from India who have taken up the positions in our community that currently exist now. Uh, if we take advantage of the region and, and with their elders and their superiors and actually greet them as recruits, put them through training, help them in the community as opposed to not helping them with regards to providing them no supports, that's a resource that could be endless coming into Thunder Bay and, and fill the positions that we need to have filled. It's a commitment. It's a commitment from the indigenous leaders. It's a commitment from the council leaders. It's a commitment from this community. But if we really want to integrate and we really want this community to grow together, uh, we need to make sure that the opportunities are available for the ones that are literally right there beside us. We see people coming from thousands of miles away taking these roles and these jobs in our community. We have people an hour and a half, two hours away that could easily come to our community if we treated them properly, help them engage, help them be part of our community. We would have no work shortage. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you to the candidates. That was the end of our round one of questions. We'll go into round two. So the first question of round two is to Ken Boschkoff. Business groups have complained that red tape and bureaucracy are a barrier to business. What is your plan to ensure that the city adopts a culture of customer service in its dealings with the public? The, the front line, of course, is our Economic Development Corporation. That's where people go first. And what we need is a fresh attitude, a receptive attitude, one that says if you want to create a business here, you want some help, uh, then we're going to go to green light as opposed to red light to start. And I've seen it many times uh, where the hoops that people have to uh, jump through is just untenable. So we've always talked about somehow fast tracking, getting these other organizations together. Uh, but it may be that uh, not very many have had uh, as much of a business background in economic development. When I talked about going out to Western Canada and developing new cargo uh, for the port here, when I talked about fundraising for the Stahl Foundation, when I talked about uh, getting the community on board for the symphony, all of these things involve uh, going to, not only to businesses, but to see, to see how, uh, do you want to help us organize? Do you, want to be, do you want to get on the same wavelength? Do you really think we could do this? Well, when they say yes, then we know yes is the way to go as opposed to here's more hoops for you. No, you didn't fill this form out. So uh, to me, it really is attitudinal, uh, whether people are receptive, because we know we have seven minds going to open up here in the next few years. Uh, if they don't put their head offices here, our competition is Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury. Are we a city that wants a green light and make sure these things happen here? Well, as mayor, you can bet I'll be there to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Our next question is for Clint Harris. Small businesses employ about two-thirds of the Canadian workforce and are a critical part of our neighborhoods and communities. How would you use city resources to support the local small business community? Well, as we saw through COVID, amazingly how the community went out and literally did everything in their power to support the restaurants, the businesses. Um, we talk about um, using our, our Facebook, our social medias, to go in and write reviews and, and talk about the things that they've, that they've done to help us during our times during COVID. Uh, messaging with regards to the successes and what they've done for us and supporting them back. Using the avenues of saying that if you support a local community, there's less travel, less gas being spent. More of that activity is, is literally, it erases. And, and what we've done in sending the message that what they've done for us and what we can do for them back and, and how we learned that lesson during COVID is a lesson that I think we can continue to learn and keep that in mind during the more challenging times, how it is that they supported us. It's so easy to press a button and press Amazon, 
but give them a chance first. If you can't afford what they're offering, let them know what it is that, that you can get somewhere else and let them at least compete so they get the opportunity to, to compete with those agencies and organizations that are literally taking over their business. Uh, my next question is for Gary Mack. Uh, many communities on the south side of town feel neglected as the housing stock deteriorates. Homelessness is on the rise and the business community struggles with street level social issues. What is your plan for revitalizing our most economically depressed neighborhoods? I believe that there are two things that we need to do to um, help our most uh, depressed neighborhoods. And it's interesting because I just was reading a study that happened in, uh, in Brooklyn where they took uh, an impoverished neighborhoods and in some of them, they cleaned up the vacant land, they uh, picked up the litter, they tidied things up, they decorated, they made, they made the neighborhoods better. And in other neighborhoods as a control group, they just left them plain. And what happened was that in the, in the neighborhoods where they uh, put a little bit of effort into them, um, Depression went down, mental health improved, crime went down, shootings went down. Because what happens is, is when you live in an area that is neglected, you feel neglected yourself. And so it actually impacts the self-esteem, the self-worth of the people living in those neighborhoods. I believe that we, there's a lot that we can do. And one of the things we can do for sure is we can uh, change the way that we do policing in Thunder Bay so we can free up our police officers' time so that they can concentrate on the serious crime that we have happening in Thunder Bay. And they can also have a proactive approach and be on the streets as community police, building relationships. In inner city situations, the way to successful policing is community policing. We know that. It's been shown over and over again, and it must become a priority for us here in Thunder Bay. I've also recommended that we move towards a new tier of first responders who are mental health workers who go out into the community and handle all of the non-violent, non-criminal uh, calls that go into police every year. Over 50,000 calls in Thunder Bay going into police with people expecting police to attend the scene. It is impossible. We have a serious crime wave happening in Thunder Bay that are making our neighborhoods unsafe. I bet you all of us were very happy we got parking spots close to the library tonight because we're going to have to go out there after dark, walk downtown and get to our cars. It's just not safe. Um, so that's my take on, uh, on uh, improving neighborhoods. Let's, uh, let's uh, change our policing. Thank you. Next question is for Robert. Racism and discrimination hurts us all. Reports such as the OIPRD report highlights how Thunder Bay needs to do more to make our city a truly safe and inclusive space for all. How will you demonstrate the city's commitment to reconciliation and the decolonization of public services? So first off, yeah, Thunder Bay big racism problem and I feel like a big problem with that is we for lack of a better word don't treat racists like the jerks they are like a lot of people in Thunder Bay just kind of go well yeah fine this police officer was racist but what do you expect and no we shouldn't just shrug it we should chastise them we should point at them and go hey don't do that it's not the hardest thing in the world not to be a jerk but apparently in Thunder Bay they just kind of shrug and go well that's the norm I'm going to stand up and not allow that to be the norm anymore. If I see racism in any sense, I'll call it out as loud as possible. I'll scream, hey, look at that guy. Let's get rid of him. But no. Uh, so, yeah, that's going to be one of the first things we're going to do is call people out on their garbage attitudes and not let that fly, be, no matter what your political or social stance. Um, the next thing to help with the uh, indigenous uh, decolonization is uh, the city Aboriginal liaison has an extremely high turnover rate and that's not okay because they, they've been hired to give you know people like me a different point of view that we don't know or can't relate to but they're ignored what's the point of having an Aboriginal liaison if we're not listening to them I'm gonna do everything in my power to sit down and listen not just hear them but actually go, okay, these are the issues you want. I'm going to do everything in my power to address every single issue. 
And I know, it's not going to be possible to fix every single thing, but I'm going to try. And trying is, I feel, the most important thing anyone can do when dealing with these kind of issues. Thank you. The next question is for Peng Yu. Abandoned homes, derelict properties, vacant commercial space and polluted industrial land abound in the city. Legacies of deindustrialization, underfunding by the province, and a hollowing out of our downtowns by strip malls, big box stores, and online shopping present unique challenges for, to the future of our city fabric. What is your plan to revitalize neighborhoods and combat the degradation of the land base? Thank you. That's a very good question. Comment about underfunded by the provincial. I am the person in the best position to obtain more support fundings from provincial. I have a strong relationship. I have a very positive relationship, not just relationship, that we know how to get the funding here. So I can direct contact uh, ministers, the premier. We don't be shy. Thunder Bay found sometimes too shy to ask for. I'm going to ask for more funding because lots of issues cannot be handled by all citizens or own city hall. We have collaborated with all levels of government for neighborhood, for the abandoned industrial land. We have to attract more business, industrial land. For example, North Cascade uh, uh, land. Now it's uh, very attractive to what? Residential? No, to the business. For example, Avalon. They want to do, plan to build refinery there. Why are we all more aggressive to attract more businesses? Use those abandoned land and use this for tax base. So CDC can play a major role. I am a director on the board of director of CEDC. That's why we have more aggressive. I know how to do that. 30 years experience in small business and then in Thunder Bay. So international tour operator, I can bring more business here. It's not that. Get more support from uh, uh, the, the provincial government. And talk about neighborhood. Neighborhood is the key. The first thing I be the uh, a council first motion and put on the floor, it was what? Neighborhood day, neighbor day. Now three years on the road. Neighbor is renewed the rebuild. If abandoned, uh, we have to give a timeline, enforce either demolish or it fixed up or pay the consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Nice on, finish. Okay, that brings us to the end of round two. We're going to start round three. <laughs> Keep you on your toes. No time to think. <laughs> okay, this first question is for uh, Clint Harris. Seniors are a growing segment of our community. Over 40% <coughs> of our residents are over the age of 50, with the fastest growing demographic being the 70 plus crowd. How would you help our city evolve to meet the needs of seniors? Well, a recent experience um, with an individual I who believe is in the room, um, the challenge obviously is seniors who are limited on a limited budget. Um, $1,300 a month doesn't get you much now. Um, I visited Spence Court the other day uh, with uh, Edith Eden and, uh, and the change of what have, has occurred in these homes with regards to no longer just seniors, um, the sites and the condition and the individuals basically making it very difficult for any of them to even be in the building. We actually helped her move out where she's about to go live in a van because she's afraid. I had an individual who was helping me who sat outside watching the van as we loaded up the van. He was afraid to be there. Um, we're not doing a very good job with regards to the affordable housing that exists in this community. We need to be serious about how we do that. When you meet with people and you see people, as I have on the streets, there are seniors also living in tents at this time as well. Uh, we've neglected and lost our moral compass with regards to how we take care of them. You literally can't continue on to make changes like we did in the senior homes that exist now and expect our seniors to feel safe and secure in the environment, and especially the only one they can afford. Um, 
I know Edith is in the room here now and she's been advocating for me with regards to the fact that boots on the ground are important. You need to actually see what's happening. And once you see it, then you act. Until it's in your neighborhood or part of your family, uh, it's something that we don't act on. So my experience just recently with Edith at that particular time, uh, we should be ashamed of ourselves how we're treating that and what we're allowing to happen in the community for the people who can only afford to live in the housing that we provide. So that needs to stop and that needs to change and those changes need to happen now. People are moving out and about to live in their vehicles because they're afraid to live in the homes that they're in now. So number one, we need to make sure that they're safe and secure and can have a place to afford to live. The next question is for Rob Schapansky. There's concern in the community that property taxes are high and increasing well, every you, year. However, surveys show that citizens and businesses are willing to pay current tax rates if they feel they are getting value for their tax dollar. What is your plan to ensure that Thunder Bay gets a good return on its investment in tax dollars? Um, so really quick. Thank you. Um, we should basically be taxing the 1% and making it easier for everyday average Joes to afford houses because most people in my demographic and age and financial stats, owning a house is a pipe dream. Like, if I don't win this, I know I'm never going to be a homeowner. And that's, that's life for most of us where we have to go, well, <clears throat> that's life. I can't afford a house. I can't afford this stuff. I can't afford anything nice. And landlords keep hiking up rent, hiking up rent, because well, the property tax is going up. So maybe property tax cuts on landlords so that we, as the tenants, can afford to maintain living and maybe even save a couple bucks here or there. But all, all in all, the people who say, oh yeah, I'm okay with paying higher taxes on my house, are the people who can afford to own houses. Talk to anyone else in the real demographic of financial stats and no, no, we're not okay with that. We, we want to be able to afford stuff. Basically, I want to try and make the city more affordable for average wage people, not just the wealthier. Excuse me. Yeah. Thanks, Chad. <laughs> the next question is for Peng Yu. Thunder Bay paid for a program and service review which was conducted by outside consultants in 2020. Can you describe two elements of the review that you endorse and articulate why it's important for the future of Thunder Bay? Yeah, first, uh, thank you for this question. First, uh, actually this uh, 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 review is necessary. 20 years we haven't had any review, but actually paid by provincial government. That's why we have to ask for support, for money. This is not paid from a local government, local taxpayer, to be clear. Second, review is necessary, but it's not go deep enough. So I do find that one thing is for uh, HR is good because the process is too long, too complicated. How can we help people? How can we keep valuable vo workforce here? So that is a good part. And also a simple one is called Thunder Bay City Corporation on the fleet. How can we reduce more interest, uh, uh, called insurance payment? Those are kind of the real stuff, you know, can save money. And, uh, but my view is they didn't go enough. I've been asking them to do the first review is from city council. What do you scare about the review of city council? Oh, no on the agenda. And then city manager said, no, oh, no, it's on the agenda. It's not on the radar. I really disappoint about that. We should review everywhere. It's called accurate uh, information we can make the right decision. And the overall, we try to do it. The best thing is make Thunder Bay Corporation more efficiency, accountable. So that's very important. And then don't forget, Thunder Bay needs the top one issue is the growth. People, we, don't, we know homeless is, is a very tough issue. And I'm afraid of people, as many citizens have homes but couldn't afford, afford to pay, and maybe not able to pay the rent, mortgage, even the fixed expenses. So this is a potential, potential dangerous for any community. We have a so high 
tax, no matter just property tax, we have so high skyrocketing expenditure now, it's a living cost. Oh, uh, right? Yep, that's, that's time. Thank you, Pagan. You see, when I start to speak, when I start to speak English, when I start to speak English well, I couldn't stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just a few seconds over. I'm sure sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't. You, you um, yeah, so the next. Talk, talk. Yeah. <laughs> so the next question is for Gary Mack. We have gaps in our physical as well as social infrastructure. Many feel that our community is at a breaking point in terms of the social issues that we face and that social services have not kept pace with the problems. What kinds of strategic investments in social services would you undertake and how do you intend to fund them? Uh, thank you. Uh, we really have to address the issues that are holding our city back, and that is uh, homelessness, mental health, substance use, and crime. People are saying that at the door over and over again. We're hearing it, and that's what the people want. Um, these are not strictly municipal issues, and so people will say to me, well, geez, that's a very ambitious uh, platform that you have there. Gary, how do you expect to do that? You're just, we have a weak mayor system, and you're just one in 13 votes. What can you do? And I have no uh, intentions whatsoever to be a weak mayor sitting, hiding behind just being one in 13 votes. I plan to champion these causes. I plan to rally people. I pl plan to rally the other uh, members of council who, of course, are going to agree that these are priorities. The public has said that over and over again. What we'll be doing is putting together a task force to end homelessness in Thunder Bay, getting the right people together. Um, it is much cheaper to house people than it is to have people uh, homeless. It can cost up to $120,000 a year per homeless person in emergency services, police time, incarceration, going to the emergency. If we house people, you know what they do? They stay home. They're not on the streets. They're taking, and then all, the, the most amazing part though is miracles happen. You provide housing to somebody, you watch their life change in ways you never would have before. It's a housing first model. You don't have to earn that housing. We're gonna get you into housing right now and we're gonna just see what happens. We'll provide you with the services and support that you need. Our city needs to do that. We need to do this in order to move forward. Business does not wanna locate here. Professionals do wanna locate here. Our reputation uh, internationally is, um, is really an issue and it's holding us back. And so for me, we have to address these issues and, uh, and do it now. Thank you, time is of the essence, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our last question for tonight is to Ken. The city owns a diverse array of public owned properties for a wide variety of purposes. We own golf courses, commercial office buildings, sports arenas, and parking garages. All of these are capital expenses that the city must maintain, often at taxpayers' expense. What should be the best, what should be the set of guiding principles that determine what kinds of buildings and facilities the city should run at taxpayers' expense? I guess if we ever needed an example of well, how not to do something is uh, own a boat and spend uh, close to $2 million trying to get it off the, the bottom of the river. I, uh, I think that uh, there are some projects that the city should not be involved in and that are better left to either groups that, do, that take care of vessels such as that, uh, like they do in Duluth. For us to really vault forward, we have to make sure that our city recognizes the need for the private sector to do things effectively quickly. We would already have a soccer uh, facility if uh, we would have let uh, that go to, to a project. Uh, many of these things the city does not have to be in, plain and simple, and I do believe that uh, even people who work in the city realize that, no, why, why did we take that on? So. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that aspect of city government doing everything is historic. It's, it's not relevant anymore. We have lots of people who could do things for us much more, efficient, much more efficiently 
and uh, with less uh, staff burden. So uh, we have to be open to suggestions and we have to be receptive to the balance of the public good, but efficiency and the, the hit on the taxpayer. Thank you. All right, so thank you to Michelle and Sarah for moderating so, uh, so efficiently, keeping everyone on time. I want to thank all of the candidates for attending the event. And by being here tonight, you show that you value the library and appreciate the critical role it plays in bringing our community together. I'd also like to thank everyone in the community who came out tonight or is watching at home. You know how important it is to be informed so you can exercise our most cherished right to vote and choose who will lead our city forward. Right? Advanced voting has already begun with the final day to vote October 24th. So make sure you're registered to vote and please reach out to the city clerk's office should you have any questions about the election or where you can cast your ballot. It's been an honor and a privilege to host the 2022 election events here at the library and look forward to seeing you all at the library again soon. As our election season enters the home stretch, make sure to remind all the candidates how much you value the library so they appreciate the central role <laughs> that we play in community life. <laughs>